So hello, everybody. Uh, we are really excited to have this conversation. And I didn't double check, but we think this may be one of the first or definitely one of only a few conversations at American Craft Council conferences that is focused specifically on museums and curatorial practice, which leads into our first question that we're going to be sharing with you all. But before I get there, I'm going to introduce our, spe our participants today. And I say participants up here, but I also want you to know we're thinking of you as participants too. Because you go to museums. Some of you want your artwork in museums. Some of you work in museums. Museums are definitely a part of your lives. And we want to have the conversation that happens here not only ha take place at the conference, but we'd encourage you to take some of the issues and questions that come up and, and back into your own local communities and ask some questions of your, the museums and the museum professionals who are working where you are too. So the idea is for this to become more of a constellation in some ways. So I'm not gonna go through the bios because they are in your guide, in your, um, your book, but I'm gonna tell you one of the things that I think is really fabulous about the way that this panel is constructed because you're going to be talking to people who have experience in many different kinds of museums. And there is a tendency to think about museums in this monolithic museum equals MoMA, museum equals Met kind of way. But in our field in particular, there are many different kinds of museums. And Tina Olnow has worked in a couple that I'll mention. She's worked in many, many museums, but the two in particular that are relevant to this conversation today are the years she spent at LA County Museum of Art, and then that was followed by her most recent position at the Corning Museum of Glass. So what you get is a very encyclopedic institution, but then you also get almost an encyclopedic institution that's very media specific, so medium specific. So that's where Tina is coming from. Mm -hmm. And Anna Walker is right now working at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, which is one of the largest and most outstanding uh, encyclopedic museums. I say that because that's where I had my first internship. Um, but it is an amazing collection. And so she is one of, of many departments within this big institution. But prior to that, she was the curator at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And Houston Center for Contemporary Craft was one of the more, um, more of a peer organization, I think, for the museum that I was working at uh, Museum of Contemporary Craft, which uh, closed in April of this year. So with that, um, what we are going to do is have a conver oops, sorry. We're going to have a conversation that's basically all of us talking about the field of curating, exhibitions, and museums, and really kind of let you into the kind of conversation that we wanted to have that we don't have in public, or we have in private, we have it you know, in, in these kinds of events, but we're not necessarily sharing it publicly. So there may be some things that we bring up that need a little bit of explanation, and the Crafted Conversations will be a great place to ask for more information, um, but we hope that this will help get you thinking about museums and how museums operate. So with that, I'm gonna ask both of you to share just briefly what has shifted in the last 10 years? Nice big topic to start with, right? It is, it is. I, I can start if you can yeah. too. Yeah. Um, I have been focusing on glass for um, more years than I care to say. <laughs> and um, what I've noticed is that what we were, uh, people were talking about a little bit this morning is that artists are really defining themselves differently. They don't get, say, I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I'm a designer. They may be all th of those things. And so um, for me, I've always kind of been led by, you know, where are artists taking us in terms of my curatorial work? And so for me to see this and, and kind of go on that journey with them has been very exciting. And that's the direction I see uh, more happening now. And um, for me, um, I'm gonna be very frank. I've actually been only involved in the field in these past 10 years. So my perspective is very much a part of um, this time frame, and I would say that um, one thing I've really seen shift is, um, and I'm gonna sort of talk about it, I guess I completely agree with the, what you said about the artists and artists driving the conversation, and I've also seen in the last 10 years opportunities like the positions 
of the Wingate Curatorial Fellowships, the Wingate grants that are provided to um, artists, those have increased and those have really changed, I think, our um, uh, artists and myself, our access to these positions and to really being involved in these organizations. So that's something that's really. I, I think that's a really important point because yeah. when I was in, uh, in, you know, getting my graduate degree, for example, in art history, there was no place I could have gone to yeah. study craft. And it, it just didn't really exist. Yeah. Um, and so now there are some really great degree programs mm -hmm. uh, in our area, and that's really changed a lot. So it's mm -hmm. it's it, interesting to see all the younger curatorial fellows that we had at Corning and assistant curators coming out of programs and having um, um, an experience quite different than mine mm -hmm. in education. You know, it's interesting too. Um, my experience started just a few years before the last ACC conference. So 2004 is when I be took on the position. I was working as a jeweler for um, 10 years or so before that. There's a reason I don't make jewelry anymore. It was good, but it wasn't that good. Um, so, you know, this was much better. Um, but um, I think one thing that, that I would just add to what you're saying is this really interesting turn, particularly um, thinking about in 2009 when Dirt on Delight was on view at the Walker. And uh, yeah, a lot of folks, there was, there was a real mix of responses to that, particularly at this conference in 2009. And, it's just making me think that one other turn is this um, interest in contemporary in craft and contemporary art practices that's showing up in non-craft oriented museums too. And that kind of changes our work and our fields in a, in a different way too, to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, being, I'm sort of gonna talk from a sort of split personalities of sorts, because being at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, I think the, nature of those exhibitions where they would rotate and we would have 12 exhibitions a year um, made it so that we could respond to the artists that were driving um, the conversations and we could respond to con con content that was happening within the field in a much more sort of nimble and flexible way. Um, and that's definitely, um, that was something I felt like, um, you know, you really championed at the Museum of Contemporary Craft and that was a model that I definitely like, looked to and that was happening during those 10 years. So that's, you know, I think that's something to sort of think about um, and that impact, I guess. So. Cool. Well, this leads to a good, in, a good segue into this question about institutions. And, you know, you've worked in two different kinds of institutions. You've worked in a number. Um, what has shifted in terms of um, the way craft is a part of the process of making an exhibition or building a collection at the places you've worked? Do you uh, want to start? Uh, yeah. When I was at LA County, I um, actually started out as a Greek and Roman curator. <laughs> I have a very checkered past, but, um, <laughs> and <laughs> a long story about how I got to glass, but I won't tell it. And, but anyway, suffice it to say that we had begun, the LA, LA County had a donor who approached the museum and said, I would like to start uh, donating contemporary glass, this was in 1982, to uh, LA County Museum of Art. And um, I was with the chief curator and we both looked at each other like, what's that, you know? We found out pretty quickly, but right from the very beginning, and this really informed kind of what happened with me later, was I still, and couldn't at the time, and still can't figure out why a uh, large scale cast glass sculpture by Stanislav Lubensky and Yaroslav Abrutova was going into decorative arts departments um, at museums. Like I just didn't get that, and the, you know the, the kind of disconnect was the artists working in craft associated materials were now going in new places that museums weren't equipped to follow yet or not willing to for one reason or another. So that has changed a lot, and kind of what I did at Corning was really kind of realize my dream of seeing uh, work. Uh, especially large-scale sculptural work in glass, the, the material of my museum, um, being displayed in the proper way, finally. And so, um, but you know, kind of that story of this, you know, where artists take us, how uh, d fields are defined, how museums define them, uh, the importance of having 
uh, like the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft to be really spontaneous, mm -hmm. but also the importance of the larger museums mm -hmm. to collect and preserve for the long run. Mm -hmm. um, I was always collecting for 50 years from now, thinking, what would a curator, would they like this? Will they thank me? Will they hate me? You know, you know, from just our own, you know, standpoint, not even, you know, taking out kind of all of the public and all of that, which is part of your job, but just thinking, you know, how should I collect for this institution? Because it's not about what I like, it's about what I think the collection should be, um, what the museum should, what, what kind of collection the museum should have and what should represent the museum, you know, and how to be inclusive and kind of diverse and, and all those things. And now, um, now being at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, I feel incredibly fortunate to be um, working for Cindy Strauss, who over the past 20 years has really been amassing mm -hmm. an amazing collection of um, craft, including a diversity in materials. And so coming there from the craft center, I was able to look at a lot of these objects, you know, dating from 1950 up until the present. She has the Garth Clark and Marco Vecchio collection, um, the Helen Druck collection of jewelry. It's just um, a real, um, wealth of materials there to be housed and we're looking ahead to a new building that will have dedicated gallery space for those to go on view and so that there's this idea that it's sort of been hidden up until, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's like you said, it's which department it was in. We didn't, we were sort of interspersed throughout the museum, but we don't necessarily have as significant of a gallery space as we will. So I think that there's um, sort of exciting things to be happening there and to be there at this time and looking at it with my own um, like background at the craft center with looking at that collection there, so. Which is an interesting, interesting thing when you think about, um, I don't know how many of you follow Critical Craft Forum, but uh, just in the last week or so, there was a big exhibition that opened at LA County Museum of Art. And uh, it was Lois Boardman's collection of 300 jewelry pieces, mm -hmm. and about 50 of them are on view in an exhibition called Beyond Bling. And uh, Kristen Beeler posted the live feed to the symposium. And that's a whole other conversation which we won't go into. <laughs> but um, what really came out of it for me and something that you both said that, that caught my attention just now is that I wonder what you feel or how you feel people understand the responsibility of museums to craft-based collections. And I say that partly because what came up was you know, LACMA is doing this exhibition now. Are they going to do another jewelry show anytime in the near future? Probably not. What's gonna happen to those pieces in the collection? When will they come out? Um, the artists are all, you know, woo, we're in a collection. And, and I sort of pointed out on the, the blog that, you know, yay, you're in a collection. When is the next person gonna see it after that, that show comes down? So. What are the responsibilities, just as a curator and an institution? Well, I think you really want access, and um, one of the ways I tried to do that when I was at Corning was having little shows constantly being taken from the collections, like I was really specific. I did not want any loan objects. I just wanted to take um, objects from the collection. Also, Corning has now digitized all of their uh, database so that you can search anything you want on there. And that was a very controversial thing because the database is not in by any means perfect shape. And so we have mistakes out there, we have problems, but um, kind of as a group, it was decided that it was more important to make it accessible than for it to be perfect. And that databases are constantly changing, we're constantly you know, adding to it. It's not like you catalog a library book and it stays the same for the rest of its life. It's, it's a much more living thing than that. So we've tried to, to, to make things more accessible that way because also it's not about, oh, we have 500 objects out, you know, or we have 60 objects out. It's more about how those objects are interacting with their viewers and how people are understanding them. And um, one of the things that I learned uh, at Corning when we were working on object labels was um, I thought it was really important for us to have a team that was a cross section across the museum, including you know, someone from the registrar's office, a guard, uh, some of the glass blowing staff, um, in addition to curatorial and librarian um, staff. So, uh, it, and we got a lot of, you know, kind of different points of view. And um, I did learn that uh, having that kind of mixed approach, very collaborative, 
was something that was much more comprehensible to the public. I didn't want to admit it to myself, <laughs> but it's true. And it, it really, I learned a lot from that and found that extremely valuable. You know, we talk about diversity. Um, how do we get diversity in the museum? And a lot of that diversity is right on your staffs. You just have to reach out to them and um, have them be included so that, you know, everyone at Corning from guest services to, uh, you know, people who, to guards, to um, people, you know, in the PR department are all engaging with the artwork and knowledgeable about it, even if they don't think they want to be or that's not their job, it is their job. And um, it's really changed the museum as a result. And I think, um, and I kind of want to touch on the importance of integrated um, collection display, and that's something I know that the Museum of Fine Arts Boston has really been employing, and that's something we're you know, hoping to be doing in the new um, building when it opens up with our other departments. You mentioned that you know, we're part of a large encyclopedic institution and making sure that craft is integrated within our displays, um, telling the history of um, the visual arts through with our Latin American collection, our collection of modern and contemporary art, along with our photographs and printmaking. I mean, that's something that we really are, um, I think is important and will like um, even further uh, sort of enrich our public's um, understanding of our field and um, all of us sort of what we're working alongside together. Um, one of the things I was working on was the kind of types of display that you get in different time periods. Okay. So for example, yeah. um, the new galleries that you see the slides of are 1990s to the present and they're really meant to kind of show glass today and they're very close to our demonstration amphitheater so people can see you know, how things are made and all that. And in the historical collections, the um, contemporary glass gallery, the Heinemann Gallery, goes from 1975 to 2000, which is uh, we call the 25 years that changed glass. Um, and what that is, is kind of, I wanted to show everything together, you know, craft, art, design, sculpture, all the same, just as it kind of we were showing them in museums in the, in the 80s and 90s. And then um, in the new galleries, again, the glass that has become painting and sculpture and installation is separated from design and craft finds its way all through there. It's very um, inclusive. So uh, for me, uh, it's also a history of how things are displayed and to keep that in mind also when you're looking at how you display your work, the kind of what I call the politics of display, how you understand it, um, you know, uh, the kinds of ways in which we show people objects and for them to understand. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do for the new building was to combine work with people who, uh, whose backgrounds were in glass with contemporary artists, mainstream, who worked in glass occasionally, mostly so that the um, work is so all compelling and looked incredible together. But we had this interesting experience where we had someone from the art press, and it may have been the Wall Street Journal, came in, uh, you know, contemporary art critic and said, oh, you know, I see Tony Craig, I see Kiki Smith, I see Robert Rauschenberg, you know, all people I recognize. Who are all these other wonderful artists I don't know yet? And that to me was such an important moment. It was like exactly what I wanted him to say. You know, that's exactly right. Because so often, uh, because of the materials we choose, they, we have been marginalized, and, and especially in that world. So that was a kind of a great moment to have that happen where and we're seeing it more and more. It, those things are going away. So I want to go back a little bit to one of the things you both said. Um, you were talking about integrated di display. Mm -hmm. That means that you have to work with all the other curators, mm -hmm. um, understand and have conversations about how things are working. And you've talked about, you talked about working with other people in other departments. Mm -hmm. So there's this lovely myth that the curator, and I hear it all the time, the curator comes in and chooses things and gets to put things in and they're, you know, capital C curator. That's not the case anymore, is it? No, <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, it is and it isn't to some degree um, because you do make acquisitions. Yeah. I mean, it, they do have to be um, approved, of course. So I always tell curators the first kind of their first line of people they need to sell are their colleagues and their director and then you go from there to your board um, and 
depending on how good a salesperson you are, they are either buying into your idea or vision or not. Um, but yes, you, 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 you need to work with people. And um, Corning has become, over the years, very collaborative. I mean, I was very lucky to be able to have a lot of say in what went into the new wing. But at the same time, we were also working collaborati collaboratively in many other ways. And it was very enriching uh, for me. But certainly, I come from that generation of curators where you know you kind of made the decisions mm -hmm. and, and did all that. And there were a lot of people who were really um, kind of disenfranchised in that process. So I'm glad to see you know other departments within museums becoming more active um, in in the kind of curatorial area in the sense that they uh, engage with the artwork and have become knowledgeable about it. And that makes me wonder if you might. Then, as a you know, to, to as a segue, um, I'm thinking about how working at Houston Center for Contemporary Craft is so different. You know, we're non-collecting; it's a non-collecting institution. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, working with artists mm -hmm. is entirely different in many ways than working with objects. And I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that. You know, definitely there's still, it just feels like oh, we're, we're all sort of talking about collaboration so often, but I think, um, you know, I really found value in um, two things. The, the residency program that was there, um, where we had residents who have studio spaces, and they, to me, to me the artists have always um, held a position of expertise that I, especially being a generalist, you know, someone who's covering all of the, the five um, craft mm -hmm. traditional materials, definitely look to artists um, for knowledge about these materials that I might not be able to gain myself. I mean, I did do ceramics some in undergrad, and there's definitely, like, there are some processes that I'm more familiar with than others, but there's, um, there's so much that um, learning from them through being on site, but then also through working together on exhibitions, I think I, when approaching the shows, I always tried to view it as a collaborative practice with the artist. Um, I tried to make sure that, um, and Tina, you were saying the same for even for you for displaying the objects, but you want to make sure that the artist's voice is represented, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. and that you know while we we might make choices regarding how the work is contextualized, of course we are of course we ha we have to be and acknowledge that we are gatekeepers and that we are. Um, authoritative to a certain degree, but we can also, I think, um, sort of check that and make sure that we're consulting with um, other peers and the individuals whose work that we are putting on view and that we're putting into exhibitions and contextualizing and making sure that that is um, the case. And let's it's a lot of listening, listening, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. You're yeah. Describing that's true. listening. Listening yeah. to mm -hmm. other people, listening mm -hmm. to artists, listening to yeah. materials, so many different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And res and responding to that and really having that sort of back and forth, I think, makes for a more, um, you know, rich. And I think it was interesting to sort of when putting together exhibitions rather than maybe you know we still at the craft center there was still a process of going through the director and a subcommittee for exhibition approval as opposed to maybe acquisition approval. But there was also an element of selling the artists on being part of this show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of um, expense of their own time, labor, effort. Um, whether or not we could include shipping, you know, there's a lot of um, the reality of it, putting an exhibition together is um, that there is, you know, costs involved. And so, you know, making sure that they felt that they wanted to be part of that too was important. So you're making me also think now about. Um, this question of being a curator of craft. And I just, I'm gonna pause for just a second here, and I don't know if you all know, there are a lot of people out here who may not know that almost all the, the, the films that we just saw uh, earlier this morning were exhibitions that Paul Smith, who is the Director Emeritus of uh, Museum of Contemporary Crafts, then American Craft Museum, now known as MAD, and is Paul in, in the audience? So can we give him a round of applause? Yeah. I don't know how many of you saw Paul in one of those films that we saw during the, <laughs> the break. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to notice, I mean, those were incredibly 
avant-garde and, and, and prescient exhibitions and, and ways of thinking about making. And you just get a sense that what we're doing now, in some ways, when, when I see films like that, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're experimenting with the same, same things over and over again. And um, it makes me wonder about knowledge, um, the knowledge that is acquired when you are a curator at an institution and the knowledge that you acquire for an institution itself. And I will be frank that I'm saying this as someone who was the steward of a 79-year history, uh, which uh, Oregon Ceramic Studio became Contemporary Crafts Gallery, became Museum of Contemporary Craft in partnership with Pacific Northwest College of Art. When they closed the museum, the um, archives and the, uh, the archives and the uh, collection are now in storage, and it makes me wonder, you know, I'm watching these films and I'm thinking, why do we not talk more about what all of us have been doing in museums and all these incredible things, and what happens to knowledge when we leave our institution? And what happens to craft knowledge? Yeah, um, yeah I think, you know, that's, it's particularly scary given the, um, Museum of Contemporary Craft just closing, and I think something that um, working at a at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, where it was a smaller institution, definitely always trying to think of documentation in ways, whether it is through catalogs, whether it's through the label didactics, whether it's through video or podcast, you know, trying to make sure that there is some documentation of what was done, um, and making sure that that is part of the legacy. Um, working at, the, at a larger encyclopedic institution, that type of support is structured in through our library and our ar archive system. There is, there's, um, there are, uh, you know, methods in place to save those um, stories and that information. And, you know, we, whenever we acquire an object, we always try to reach out to the artist and have you know questionnaires filled out and make sure that those become part of the artist files. But whether or not individuals, I guess, know that that exists at our institution, I think researchers do. But you know, it's something that I think um, definitely in our process of digitizing the collection, it's something worth thinking of. And you know, maybe you can speak more to that. I guess with with Corning's amazing you know, digitizing, yeah, yeah that's been such a great resource important. for us. Yeah, um, but also I think when you work for an encyclopedic institution or a large institution, you understand that you're a cog in a wheel. Yeah. And while what may be happening right now isn't good, you don't know what will be happening 40, 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, and so the most important thing for collections that are maybe in, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of a liminal situation mm -hmm. um, would be documentation and then accessibility through digital means. Mm -hmm. And then of course, um, hopefully a, some sort of a loan program that could happen. I don't know if that's possible without mm -hmm. staff. but. Um, you know, I, I do, I think that people think too much and a lot of artists think, oh, I don't want to give my work to a museum because it'll just end up in the basement, you know, and it'll never get shown. It's like, you really don't know. You don't know what discoveries are going to be made. I'm kind of excited. I was talking to a young curator and they're like, I love the 80s. And I'm like, really? You know, no, but you know what, I, it was really great because that excitement, you know, uh, that's a different kind of excitement than my excitement might be. Um, and so, and to, to know that they will, you know, carry things on. Uh, it's, it's great. So I, we can't think too much about the present, but more about the future and kind of ensuring certain things happen. And I also think the ACC has been, um, you know, very instrumental in that and, and in terms of convenings like this. And I remember um, before the 2009 conference in Houston when, you know, full disclosure, I was on the board at that time, um, we were having a series of convenings at the New York office where our, a lot of you know curators and other people who kind of thought leadership were trying to define what craft is now. This was in the, the mid 2000s, and those those convenings, even though they were informal, were tremendously helpful to me. So as long as the ACC can serve as a forum for people to come and exchange ideas and you know to exchange information about collections, all those things, it's tremendously important. Um, so keep doing what we're doing, but just do more of, of it. And even if certain things are happening with certain institutions at a certain time, that may change. Like the Museum of Craft and Folk Art in LA, 
that closed for several years, it's reopened. So you know, you never know uh, what's sure. coming down the road. Sure. So I'm going to switch gears a second. Um, I'm thinking about uh, your role, and one of the one of the exciting things I think in the craft field that I feel is a little bit different than in some par other parts of the visual arts is we have a lot of women who have leadership positions. Yes, I think that deserves an applause. Definitely deserves an applause. And I would like both of you to think about something that you feel you have done or you are working on to do that has changed the field, has changed craft in some way. I think it's hard to talk about changing the field when people like Paul Smith are here, but um, as someone who is really impacted. But I think, uh, you know, there's all kinds of impacts that you make. And for me, um, personally, I think it has been my publications where I've tried to um, bring scholarship to the field. And um, uh, and then, of course, the uh, new, new buildings at Corning. And you see right now the, 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 the contemporary glass galleries and then, of course, the new galleries. But what I wanted to do was really, um, you know, show glass in all of its permutations. And for me, I had the wonderful luxury of being able to go into one material and really look at the development of that material as a material for art and, and historically and in the present. So that was a wonderful way for me to, to focus on that and very unusual. Uh, most of the time, curators have to take care of, you know, hi, I do sculpture from Neolithic times to the 18th century, you know, just huge swaths of time that you're responsible for. And um, a lot of times you feel like you're not doing much more than being a collections manager. Uh, so when you do get an opportunity to go deep and to do research and to present, Things it's a it's a wonderful thing. So you know I, I think I've been very fortunate that way. Yeah, and uh, having you know not even been in the field yet ten years, I really don't. I'm not sure that I can speak to changing, but I can speak to um, an exhibition that I thought was very um, of the moment. I was really proud to have happen, which was this Control P show that was involved in digital technologies, and it was happening. I was researching it and really thinking about it at a time in, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, when you know, 3D printing has now become very much a regular part of conversation, even in this short time frame. At that point, it was still, and it still might be considered somewhat um, mysterious to people, but um, I was able to work on and curate this show that went beyond just sort of looking at this uh, this tool and looking at, you know, oh, look at the cool things this tool can make, but really thinking about how this tool impacts different ways for artists to collaborate across geography, to think about issues regarding authorship and regarding um, open source technologies and digital media and the way in which we share information and how things have really changed. So I think that for me, um, when I was able to finally like sort of do an exhibition that was happening at the time that we were having, you know, that felt like, okay, like as opposed to saying like, oh, well, I got that done, but it took three years to plan it, and now everyone's tired of having, you know, like this, this conversation is, is over, like we don't need to talk about this anymore. Like I feel like if I had that show today, everyone would be like, ah, it's nice, but it's five years too late. Like <laughs> I just, you know, I think, you know, I felt a little bit, so that I'd say it's one thing I feel proud about, but I don't know about field changer, but maybe you, you also should. Do you want me to answer? You should answer that question. <laughs> um, I don't think people understand that the so Contemporary Crafts Gallery, when we got there in 04, there were 12,000 people who came in. There was a plastic bag bladder that we emptied every day in the morning and evening to get the rainwater we caught out because we couldn't fix the roof. There were vines growing into the collection storage. So those of you who have seen the museum or seen the website, it looks really slick. It looks amazing. It was not a museum. And I think that's partly why I was asking the question about our knowledge and where it goes, because the gatekeepers who preceded us were not necessarily gatekeeping craft and craft history with the idea of the professionalism that museums have mm -hmm. um, today. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm concerned about that loss. And so um, for me, I'd say that that's probably, that would probably be um, the thing. I'm, I, I feel like we, we did some changes. There was a great team of people. It wasn't just, just one person. It was a lot of people who came together and made well, a museum. It reminds me of a Bill Warmus, who's another person in our audience who's done a lot for Glass um, and who will be on a, a panel, criticism panel later. He said, you know, at the time, they weren't even sure that it was a going thing. I mean, you know, what if Studio Glass just folded five years in and that was it? And so I think that to me was really inspirational because it's really important, like, and of course, artists are much more used to doing this, going forward blind and just trusting that you're doing this in the right way and, you know, trusting in that vision that you have. And then that's, I think, a, a, a kind of a, it's important to realize that and something that it, anyway I have learned from artists specifically how to do that, you know, how to just go forward um, even if you're going into something completely unknown. So we have time for one last question and I want us to look a little bit to the future and I'm thinking about the way that um, all of us act as mentors and shaping the field in terms of other people who are out here who are interested in becoming curators or the way we work with artists. And um, this has come up already a couple times at this conference, but um, I'm personally particularly aware of, of um, the demographics in the field because I am, I believe we've, we've been researching it and I believe I'm the first American of South Asian origin to direct a collecting art museum in the United States. And I'm certainly the only one in the United States of my background um, to be the first generation raised here. When Larry Sims and I left our positions, there are, I believe, no curators in institutional positions who are not of European origin curating in our field. So looking forward, how are we going to work on this and make it and change it? How can we do that? Um, the woman who was the president of the museum while I was there uh, had come to that position from being head of um, HR for Corning Incorporated. And her um, specific thing that she did was she brought diversity to that um, workforce. And so, um, she, she is very specific, you know, you just have to really, you can't just wait for those resumes to walk in the door. You have to go find them. And um, you know, everything we've been talking about today, beginning with education, beginning with looking how to um, uh, incorporate diverse audiences that you might even have in your own institutions in, in other ways that maybe you hadn't thought of before, um, kind of all those things, because it, it is a huge problem, especially in our field, the lack of diversity, it's huge. And we have to be able to, you know, we're, we have to work harder. We're just not working hard enough. Right. And I definitely think we have to, I mean, <clears throat> I think that the internships and the positions, I think some, you know, it was mentioned earlier, making sure to reach folks when they are younger and, you know, undergrads or becoming interested in the field. But we have to make those positions paid or we have to make those positions uh, in some capacity livable for people to be able to um, pay their, whether the housing provided and there's a food, you know, some way that makes it livable because otherwise we aren't Not going to reach it. people who, um, you know, who um, can provide their own, you know, fun funding, who come from means and are able to have an unpaid internship. I mean, having unpaid um, labor really, I think, impacts that aspect of of our field, so we really have to think about that. And, and also just more ways that people can find out about, kind of demystify what museum positions are or even curatorial yeah. positions. Yeah. And, um, you know, so many times I've been asked to go to schools, mostly art schools, you know, do critiques, maybe give a lecture, but no one had ever really asked me, well, what do you do and how did you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, like, why do you do what you do? Um, and just only very recently was I asked to kind of give a lecture on that at Alfred. Mm -hmm. And it, it was great because I, I, it never occurred to me, like, why, you know, why? But, you know, artists are a tremendous pool for curatorial uh, work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't think that they're reached hardly at all. I mean, that's just one area. So, yeah. 
um, you know. So there's an opportunity. Lots of different ways. You know, I'd say there's just, you're making me think that there's an opportunity actually if somebody is interested in developing more curatorial programs that are, are craft specific or, or finding ways to, um, to expand your studio making, um, your studio art and your, your uh, uh, materially based pro uh, programs mm -hmm. to actually incorporate a little more art history and bring in more opportunities um, because the students are there mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, or more represented I should say in, um, in those programs, not enough, but better than in my art history classes and your art history classes, I'm sure. Yeah, and I should mention also, and maybe a model for this is the recent, the Andrew Mellon Foundation has been underwriting undergraduate fellowships across the country with five different institutions, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, one of them, where they're focused on um, um, underserved populations and making sure that those um, internships and they and they also all those individuals who are part of that program convene once a year. It's it it has um, it has a great um, structure to it and it's it's relatively new. It's I think it's been around for two or three years now. So um, that's one way in which um, something's starting. So maybe we can have all of our craft institutions become more part part of that as well. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for participating in the conversation, and I hope that you all have had some questions come up, things you want to understand better, ways you want to think about becoming a curator. <laughs> we would love to talk with you more, and we will be available at the tables in the uh, conversations later this afternoon. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening.